well we are we are now on the hour um so i will um kick things off uh, but just take it to a gentle start for the latecomers so i'm mike tuffery uh, you're very welcome to this institute of business ethics webinar uh, i am a trustee of the ibe as indeed are all the speakers today um, I co-founded Corporate Citizenship, which is a consultancy working with large companies on being good corporate citizens, the whole range of issues from, through sustainability, ethics, the works. Um, and I also sit on a number of uh, boards uh, as a non-executive director. So that's enough about me. Uh, I'm very well, very pleased that we have Professor David Grayson, who has uh, a book that he's going to talk to us a bit about, and we're going to have a discussion about that. And incidentally, I'm going to let each of the panelists introduce themselves. Um, uh, but David is a professor at Cranfield, so very welcome to David. Uh, next up, after David's spoken to us for a few minutes, will be uh, Lu Louise. Um, many things I could say, but I'll simply say former <laughs> Uh, Corporate Affairs Director at L'Oreal and leave you, Louise, to, to do the rest. Uh, and then thirdly speaking will be Lauren. Uh, Lauren, your job title is a little unmanageable, but it says here you're Chief People Officer and Head of Corporate Affairs at the Lego Group. Um, so you're very welcome. Uh, I'm in London. You're probably in Denmark. I don't know, but uh, people can add their geographical location. OK, that's enough for uh, introductions of the panel. Let me just say, for those of you who have not joined an IBE, a webinar before or don't know much about us, or new to us, our purpose is to champion the highest uh, standards of ethical behavior in business. And we do that through advocacy, through training, through thought leadership, um, through publications, events like this one uh, and networking. Uh, and we always welcome new supporters. Um, now our session today, after the, the panelists have all had their say. We're going to open it to questions, so I'd urge you to use the Q&A function at any point during the webinar. Uh, if you have technical issues, put that into the chat and you'll be responded to, but Q&A is into the Q&A, or the queues into the Q&A, and we'll give the answers and get a bit of a discussion uh, going. So I think that is it. Without further ado, uh, I'm going to hand over to David. Take it away, David. Mike, thank you very much. Um, good afternoon, everyone. As Mike says, amongst the different things I do, I am a professor, now an emeritus professor, at the Cranfield School of Management. I'm also chair of the Institute of Business Ethics. I'm delighted to, to be so. At Cranfield, we now have a compulsory course on embedding sustainability and leading sustainable businesses for our MBA programs, both our full-time MBA and for our executive MBA programs. And on the executive MBA program, we have made this one of the introductory foundational courses for the entire two years. So you start your two years on the exec MBA and then your first month, you have this foundational module looking at what it means to embed sustainability successfully in an organization. And one of the things that we ask our students to do in preparation for that module is to go and interview the most senior person they can get at in their own organization and to talk to them about their organization's commitments around sustainability. And we give a very simple interview protocol to, to help them to do that. And what is fascinating, I've had the privilege now of reading some 250 different exec MBA student reports over the last uh, 14, 15 months. And the number of times that in those individual student reports, they've talked about the fact that, well, our organization is just for the first time appointing a chief sustainability officer, or we're just appointing a director of sustainability or somebody who is going to be brought into the organization to lead on this, these issues. We're just in the process of putting together for the first time a sustainability strategy across the business, or we are taking a totally new look at our approach to ESG, the environmental and the social and the governance aspects of running a business, which many people use as a substitute term for sustainable business. And I'm very struck by all of those student reports 
but also when I talk to people like Mike and others who are working with businesses around the world, and how many people are talking about the fact that it really does feel as if there's something now of a tipping point when it comes to organizations understanding that they need to take a much more holistic approach to the responsibilities that they have for their social and their environmental and economic impacts. And by sustainable business, I simply mean a business that tries to minimize its negative social, environmental and economic impacts and tries to maximize its positive impacts and that it sees doing so as a superior route to long-term business performance, as giving it a better chance of being able to continue into the indefinite future. And so 15 months, 18 months ago, when Kogan Page, which is now our largest UK independent publisher, came to me and said, we would be interested in working with you on producing a sustainable business handbook. I immediately said, well, I've got a couple of co-authors who I've recently written another book with, um, All In, The Future of Business Leadership. Let me talk to them. And we all agreed that given this increased interest in how organizations organize for sustainability, the idea of writing a handbook rather appealed. We frankly, none of us had written a handbook before, so we had to learn on the job what's involved in, in writing a handbook. And as you'll see in the in, in the next slide, we tried to identify what we thought were the most um, important factors in terms of embedding sustainability. So if we can have the, the next slide, please, Alex. This looks at things like, how do you work out what is your organizational purpose? How do you make a business case for really taking sustainability seriously? How do you put together a comprehensive sustainability strategy and so on? And we looked at a number of the critical components of doing all of that successfully. And of course, right at the heart of embedding sustainable business is how you want people associated with the business to behave, how you want people to treat each other, what kind of culture does the organization want? In the IBE, we've been saying for many years, every organization, any sector, whether it's business or a public sector or a voluntary community sector organization, any organization, has a culture, the only question is whether the culture is one that the organization has consciously desired and tried to design and bring into, in, in, into existence, or whether it's one which has just happened, it's grown up by, by topsy without a great deal of thought or, or attention. And so one of the critical chapters for me, and the one that I'm really interested in talking about with Louise and, and Lauren and, and, and you, Mike, this afternoon, is this whole question of how we build a truly sustainable culture and, and, and what goes into that. In our handbook, for every chapter, we have a standard format and we have, as part of that standard format, what we're talking about, why it matters, how to do it well, step by step, but then critically, a couple of examples. Um, in each case, we took a company that you would probably associate with sustainable business, if you thought about it. And then we also profiled, in addition to those well-known names, we profiled a business that you might not be familiar with, that you might not have come across in the context of sustainable business. You might even be surprised that they're included in a sustainable business uh, handbook. In the case of, of our culture chapter, we looked at IKEA, well-established culture around sustainability. And we also looked at the Brazilian paper pulp manufacturer, Suzano. But before I talk a little bit about Suzano, let me just talk about the essence of what we think a, a sustainable business culture really is. And from our previous book that we'd done together, Chris Coulter and Mark Lee and I defined really that there were four critical dimensions 
of what it is really to be a sustainable business. If I can go on, please, Alex, to the, the last slide. Thank you. And what we found in looking at lots of organizations around the world was that there were four really critical interlinking, mutually reinforcing dimensions of what really goes in to make up a, a sustainable culture. At its heart, of course, it is responsible and ethical. So it goes absolutely to the core of what we work on at the Institute of Business Ethics. What is a, a really strong ethical culture? How you can encourage that with a code of ethics, with socialization of such a code regularly updated, with training, with communications, with live examples and dilemmas that leaders or different people in the organization have confronted when it comes to doing business ethically. How you have a culture which is truly engaging and empowering. I'm a huge fan of Daniel Pink and his brilliant book about what really motivates us. And Daniel Pink in that book, Drive, talks about three critical things. He talks about the fact that we need to have a sense of mastery that if we've been given a job to do, we really understand what's involved in doing that job well, that we have a sense of, of training and, and, and that we understand the task in hand, we have that mastery. Secondly, says Daniel Pink, we need to have autonomy. Once I've been given a job to do, I don't want to be micromanaged. I want to be freed up to be able to take the initiative, to take responsibility, to be able to find the best ways of, 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 of doing things. And says Daniel Pink, in addition to mastery and autonomy, we need to feel it's worthwhile, that there is a, a sense of purpose. And I'm a great believer in organisations going the extra mile to create a truly engaging and empowering organization and both Louise and, and Lauren have been associated or are associated with organizations that, that do that uh, so well. When we wrote our last book, the uh, All In, The Future of Business Leadership, Chris and Mark and I thought it was just something that was axiomatic, you would just take as read, that if you were gonna be really engaging and empowering, you would be encouraging the organization to be truly diverse and inclusive and being equitable in, it, in its dealings. But we recognize, particularly after things like the brutal murder of George Floyd and Black Lives Matters and the Me Too movement and so on, that we need to be much more explicit in the sustainable business handbook in emphasizing the importance of diversity and equity and inclusion as an integral part of how you create both engagement and empowerment, but also it's a fundamental part of being responsible and ethical. And the other two dimensions that we emphasized are about innovation. We interviewed Nike, uh, who talked about the fact that for them, innovation and sustainability are now absolutely interchangeable as ideas because all the innovation should be to drive sustainability. Sustainability should be the driving force that really pushes innovation through their business. But it's innovation and being open to ideas coming from wherever, whether it comes from the R&D department or it comes from the frontline sales supervisor or from the call center, but equally, it might come from a totally different part of the business. What was really interesting when we looked at Susano, this Brazilian paper pulp manufacturer, which itself is the merger of two previous companies, was the way in which they have successfully built a sustainable culture with a very strong ethical code going right through the middle of it, but also with clarity through, the, through their values that really encourages people to want to contribute to the business and how it wasn't, in the case of Susano, the sustainability function that was leading on lots of the greatest innovations that the business has been making around sustainable business in, in the last two or three years. It was, for example, the finance department that had taken the initiative and had developed and had successfully run the first ever sustainability-related corporate bond 
in the whole of, of Latin America. They'd actually driven that, not the sustainability specialist function. Similarly, even before the merger of, of, of the two businesses, the predecessor investor relations department had been, in their words, absolutely sustainability fluent. So they were able to lead the regular investor relations dialogues around sustainability, but also around the rest of the, the business performance. And the last aspect of um, we think of, of, of creating the sustainable business culture is about transparency and accountability um, and really addressing um, that by making information available because that's the way that you make clear the information needs that you might have, the project needs, the, the gaps in your innovation portfolio that you're looking for help with. That's why I think transparency and accountability becomes absolutely interlinked with the, the other dimensions, particularly if you want to engage and empower your employees, you've really got to provide the regular information flows. You've got to be able to, to help people to understand where the business is looking for help and being humble enough to actually be open to, to those approaches. So that, Mike, is, is, is a bit of an overview of the sustainable business chapter. Um, and I'm delighted to, to hand over, first of all, to, to Louise, um, who's going to give us um, some reflections and, and tell me where I've got it wrong or where we've got it wrong, or indeed where we should be emphasising more. So over to Louise. Thank you, David. I hope I've unmuted myself appropriately. Um, so a fascinating introduction to your book, and, and um, we were lucky enough to have an advanced copy when you asked us very kindly to join you on this panel. And um, I have to say that I really wish this book had existed when I was doing my role at, at L'Oreal because it felt a bit back then as if we were sort of making it up as we went along. And it's not to say that um, companies that I've worked for weren't doing ethical things, they were. Um, but first of all, they weren't really talking about it very much. Um, uh, and secondly, um, they were all kind of siloed throughout the business in different areas. So there's, I think part of this cultural point is about bringing all of these things together into one uh, mission that the whole organisation can get behind. So, of course, um, I believe that communications is a really key part of that for sharing. So, so um, just looking at this fantastic framework that you've created. I mean, you were kind enough to, to include L'Oreal in it, and it's true that they have certainly been on a really interesting sort of voyage of discovery. And I'd say that, you know, when I joined back in 2004, I joined, in fact, from a, a similar role at Coca-Cola, um, you know, there was CSR, which belonged in my kind of corporate affairs area. Uh, you had sort of HR initiatives on diversity and inclusion, and you had the operations team looking at how to make the factories and all of the production um, things less, less environmentally damaging. So there's a lot going on. But I would say that back then, the culture at L'Oreal was very much about product. You know, it was a beauty company. It's first and foremost all about the gloss and the glamour. And there was a feeling then perhaps slightly sort of paternalistic to say, um, we don't need to talk about all of the stuff that goes on behind the scenes. Um, we talk about our products and beauty, and we do all the ethical things behind the scenes. And I think what changed, and certainly when we bought the Body Shop in 2006, which of course is known as such an ethical company, we realised, uh, to our dismay, I think then, that we weren't seen as quite as eth ethical as we thought we should be. Um, so there was a big change, and also, of course, a younger, new generation of employees who, as you said, David, really, really want to feel they're making a big difference in the world and, and do something that really matters. So for all of those reasons, actually, I would argue that communications was totally um, central to, to sharing the sort of the, the mission internally and helping build that culture. Um, so I thought I'd just mention a couple of things. You talked about setting the tone or tone from the top. And my experience is certainly that um, leadership behaviour is probably the single most important um, aspect. So, again, at L'Oreal, we used to, from the very top, have an ethics day once or even twice a year when everybody in the company could um, take part in a webinar that was global, open, transparent. They could ask any question of the CEO and the tone was absolutely set as an expectation of how we behave in this company, um, you know, modeling the very highest um, code of behavior. 
Um, not only that, but I mean, and I'm sure Lauren will pick up on this from a people point of view, but but um, expectations of leadership behaviour were embedded as well in the appraisal system. So you weren't simply reviewed on your functional objectives, if you like. You also had to um, demonstrate the extent to which you had um, modelled your behaviour on the, 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 the values of L'Oreal. Um, and we also did surveys, so very collaborative, working with um, HR. There was a thing called a pulse survey, which, again, once or twice a year would across the company and be able to compare team by team, look at how people were feeling across a whole um, a whole piece of a whole, a whole load of different dimensions. Um, so those were all important, but but I guess my favorite topic obviously is, um, and if there was any improvement I could possibly make to your book, it would be about really showing how important communications is at every stage, not just the sort of showing what you've achieved, but actually sharing what you want to achieve and, and what progress is being made. Um, so, you know, employee um, communications, most of all. And we did a lot of work, for example, at L'Oreal with, it, it thrived on a very competitive atmosphere. So when one team could see that another team was being celebrated because they'd done X, Y, or Z, it sort of raised the bar for everyone else. Um, Two very um, quick examples, um, one of which was um, I discovered that L'Oreal was doing the most incredible work on um, finding alternatives to animal testing. Animal testing, a huge issue, big ethical issue in the, in the whole industry. And L'Oreal had been creating or working on this reconstructed human skin, which would replace animal tests in a, in a, a lot of cases, and, but, but hadn't shared it with anybody. And it was still maybe a year off being validated by um, the European Commission. So we did a lot of work to share this internally and externally. We took panels of stakeholders, um, animal rights groups to see this work in progress in the labs. And uh, it, was, it was a scary topic to embrace, but I think particularly employees were immensely proud of that um, and could see that L'Oreal was really leading the way in, um, in finding alternatives. And the second example would be about advertising responsibility, where um, we certainly um, you know, got into a bit of trouble a few times for some exaggerated images of what co certain cosmetics could achieve. And, and we were accused of damaging young girls' self-esteem and not at all the kind of thing that we wanted to do. Um, and I worked particularly hard internally to actually look at L'Oreal's advertising strategy and, and how it could be changed and be more inclusive and more diverse. Um, and this was something that was shared, you know, across the teams again, because we needed all the marketing teams to to work with us. So just a couple of examples of, of you know, everyday ethical issues and how we were very open about them in order to try very hard to to create nurture this this culture. Um, and um, I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Lauren, who is um, doing this a very similar role, I think, right now in the Lego group. Lauren. Great. Hopefully everyone can hear me and see me. And it's it's really wonderful to, to be here, both as a trustee of the, the IBE and, and in my role. Well, actually, you know, Mike has said is a bit of a mouthful, my role, and that's because it's actually two roles. It's the chief people officer and the head of corporate affairs. So I actually run uh, two different departments, but um, it's quite interesting, of course, to have the accountability to drive the people agenda and, and at the same time to drive the corporate affairs agenda of which is, is the core driver of our sustainability strategy. Uh, so I'm happy maybe later if people are interested to share some perspectives on bringing those two agendas together, people and sustainability. Um, so I could cover this from a lot of different angles and I think uh, David, the, your, your book is fantastic. I also had a chance to to read it and certainly the chapter on on culture which we're going to open up uh today uh and you know whether it's innovation or the openness and transparency the empowerment i'll touch on some of those themes but i thought what i could bring of value to this conversation is the perspective from the lego group and maybe a little bit of an inside insider's view on how we address many of these these issues I'm super proud, first of all, and humble to, to work for the Lego Group. It's, it's a company that is considered um, as one of the most reputable companies in the world by, by various uh, external um, 
parties that that do this type of assessment rep track is one of them where we've been in the top three most reputable companies uh, uh, over the last uh, 10 years and um, what's also interesting about the lego group is that we're a private enterprise so we've been owned by the same family uh, for four generations and we're in august we will have our 90th uh, anniversary uh, and i think that you know being a private organization and being a company that's been around that long uh, I mean, that is sustainability in, in one sense of the word, uh, but it's a, it's, it's a family ownership that really thinks about how to ensure that the company can grow in a sustainable way uh, for the next generation. And it's incredibly purpose and, and values driven. Our mission, I think, which is something most people can feel a sense of affinity to, it's, it's very genuine, is to inspire and develop the builders of tomorrow. So it's very child centric. It's about uh, developing children through our value proposition, which is learning through play. So there's a lot of focus on children's development, on learning, the link to the uh, sustainable development goals, of course, SDG4, which is around uh, ensure inclusive and equitable quality education and lifelong learning. That's something that's close to us and we choose to focus on, the, on that particular SDG in addition to the environmental ones. We, how we put uh, some of the concepts, uh, David, that you, the, that you mentioned into practice is through uh, what we have it, which is called the Lego brand framework. And we have four promises. Uh, one is the planet promise. And that's to have a positive impact. Uh, another is the people promise, which is about succeeding and growing together. The, the third promise is the play promise. And that's about the joy of building the pride of creation uh, that, that children have when engaging with our, our products. And the fourth is the, the partner promise, which is about uh, mutual value creation with partners both upstream and downstream in the supply chain. And maybe a more cynical uh, viewer or participant today could say, well, a lot of companies have these, these different promises. I think what I've worked for six other organizations, and I think what, what, what makes the Lego group unique is that they are consequential. So each of these has a what we call a pinnacle KPI associated with it. Those are hard, hard KPIs. And we are the only organization now. It, now you hear a lot of talk about uh, executives of publicly traded companies or private companies that they should have ESG targets that are in their remuneration. This is something that's been embedded. I've been at the Lego Group for seven and a half years, and it, it was embedded before I got here. So actually, my remuneration and the rest of the executive leadership team uh, is a function of all four of these promises. Uh, and not just commercial targets. And actually our people promise, interestingly enough, is 25% of our variable pay, where our EBIT, our profitability is only 15%. Uh, so I don't know how many other organizations would slice and dice it that way, but I think it, it gives you a sense of where we put the emphasis and, and put our money where our mouth is, so to speak. And the way in which we look at these promises and why they're, they're set up each with a pinnacle KPI is they each have uh, value uh, in terms of creating a sustainable business in the future and, and, and they require trade-offs. You can't always satisfy the planet needs with the commercial needs, with the partner needs. So you're forced into trade-offs all the time in the complex world that we operate in. And at least the, having all of these as consequential KPIs uh, for the organization, including the executives, forces very real trade-off discussions, which is not necessarily something I experienced in the other organizations I worked in where there were trade-off discussions, but clearly economic value creation was by far the one that won all the time because that's what people were, were remunerated on. So those are just a few examples. If there's curiosity, I could go into a little bit more detail and may, maybe just two more comments. Uh, uh, I think it's super important to have the mechanisms in place, the processes, the mechanisms, the tools, the training, and we could get into, into those uh, uh, as well. Uh, but the culture, ultimately, which I think is the theme that, uh, David, your book is emphasizing so well, it, it all in the end 
comes down to, to culture. And, and culture is in motion all the time and is shaped by uh, the mechanisms uh, that you put in place. But ultimately, in, in the so-called VUCA, volatile, uncertain, complex, uh, and ambiguous world that we live in, if, if you're not empowering your people and ensuring that they feel a sense of accountabil accountability, regardless of what role they're in, regardless of what level, what function, what part of the world, then there's no way of sustaining a sustainable and ethical organization because things are happening way too fast for a traditional hierarchy to, to operate. You need everyone to feel that sense that they have a leadership role in the organization, that they have to take accountability. And at the LEGO Group, we uh, try and instill this through a, a leadership framework that we call the Leadership Playground, which is obviously language that is uh, uh, very unique to the to the Lego group, but it's about uh, leadership is is for all, and we it's not about what position you have. Certainly, people leaders play a different role and have some different accountabilities, but we all have a leadership role to play to support an open, transparent culture where people feel psychologically safe to challenge each other, because we know we're also tied together to the core purpose and values of the organization and our aspiration to be a sustainable business and be here for the next uh, generation or the next 90 years. So let me pause there and hopefully that uh, triggered some curiosity. Uh, wow, thank you, Lauren, excellent. There's so much to get in. And I'm really jealous of your um, uh, your background there. Yeah, those, <laughs> my, are, those are real Lego sets. Yeah, I'll, my daughter, always keep them behind me. <laughs> my daughter's just done your blacksmith uh, kit. Oh, beautiful. Which, yeah, absolutely. I almost brought it on, but the product placement today is David's book. So we must get back to the topic in hand. Um, and there is the book. That's great. Thank you, David. So um, now, can I remind you, uh, participants, uh, to put your questions in, in the Q&A? We had a couple uh, previously, and there are some in there now. The very first one was just technically asking whether this is being recorded, and I should have said it is. Uh, and therefore, if you have to drop out before the end, we hope not, you can catch up uh, later. And I should also have said at the outset that we are live tweeting with the hashtag business ethics and IBE UK, which is our Twitter handle. Uh, the, the ethics of Twitter might be a topic uh, for another session, given what's going on there. But so back to uh, ethical culture. Um, and um, we've got a lot to dig into. I wanted to jump straight in, um, well, just while I'm looking at the questions, to one of the conundrums at the heart of this. You all talked about, well, Lauren, you said culture is in motion, that you have to therefore, you know, stuff is happening all the time. You have to empower people, trust people, respect difference. But how do we reconcile that with, what are the non-negotiables? Because many codes of ethics, have you know the do's and the don'ts and while I'm sure we all don't think this is about compliance there are some don'ts <laughs> so it isn't a free-for-all can anybody who wants to jump straight in uh, maybe I should give first word to David this reconciliation between empowering people respecting differences but nonetheless some non-negotiable basics that we can't uh, we can't breach um, so David first and then um, and then Lauren and then Louise so I think it's a great question Mike and I think the successful organizations doing this can combine the top down and the bottom up. In other words, they have a clarity about their overall purpose. Why are we here? How is the world a better place? Because we are in existence. And here's our overall broad strategy. And maybe with some of those wonderful BHAGs, the big, hairy, audacious goals to show my age in terms of management um, um, kind of great books. Um, the importance of having that overall sense of direction where we're going to, but then, and, and of course, part of that is having a strong definition of how we want to do business, whether that's a code of general business principles, or it's a code of ethics, whatever the organization is comfortable calling it, so that there is a sense of not just where we're going and, and, and what are our big goals, but also how we want to deliver on, on those, those goals. Back to 
what Lauren was talking about with the Lego brand framework and those four promises. But then you want to create the culture and the, the way of being inside the organization that really encourages the bottom up, the discretionary energy and effort and ideas and suggestions and championing from the mass of employees. So I love that idea of the Lego leadership playground and this sense of leadership at all levels. The very first book I wrote with Adrian Hodges 20 years ago, um, or 21 years ago actually now, we called everybody's business because we wanted to get across that if you really wanted to drive this through a business, so it wasn't going to be a bolt on, but was going to be built into business purpose and strategy. You couldn't just rely on a specialist function. They had a role. They had an important contribution to make. They could be the coach and the consultant and the communicator and the cajoler and sometimes the conscience of, of, of an organization. But it had to involve everybody. So I think it is that getting that clever mix of the top down and the bottom up. Right. Lauren? Yep. No, it's totally uh, aligned with that. Uh, and maybe to, to build a, um, or, or a kind of a both end. And that's what I was referring to, the, 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 mechaniz the mechanisms and, and the culture. So, you know, within the Lego, we have those mechanisms. I mean, we have a, a um, uh, obviously from a corporate compliance perspective, we have our code of ethical business conduct. As soon as you start at the Lego Group, you need to take the training. You need to redo it every year. Uh, we do mocked on raids. There's competition law training. There's business conduct with integrity. Uh, with uh, there's DNI training, so on and so forth. And then we measure that through. Uh, uh, Louise was also mentioning various employee surveys in terms of their their understanding of, of the code of conduct, the the, the ethical um, and uh, and our principles on DNI and so on and so forth. So we have all of those mechanisms, and I think those are that's that's critical uh, backbone. Uh, but I think what ultimately counts in the end is is the culture, because uh, and and you could only operate culture and uh, based on my experience. Uh, it through inspiration and through aspiration. So it's, it's a little bit of freedom within a frame. So the, the mechanisms create some frames, the do's and don'ts, but the world is changing all the time. And, you know, whereas, uh, and you, you brought it up before, uh, you know, me too, you know, the way in which women were treated and what was permissible 20 years ago, uh, as an example, is today absolutely not permiss permissible. So that's what I mean by culture in motion. And you can't predict necessarily where it's going to go, which is why you need to have aspirational values and you need to give people accountability and the empowerment. So they're not afraid to take uh, brave uh, decisions, uh, but at the same time, when you come up again against those boundaries, uh, then you need to integrate them uh, and you get new learnings and integrate them back into your mechanisms. Yeah. And Louise, and can you just pick up the question we've had in um, specifically about L'Oreal? I don't know if you saw that. What happens if an employee raises a question that the I saw that. Makes? Great. Very good question. Very good question. Um, I was trying to remember, actually, when I saw the question, whether we did um, sort of doctor that, you know, keep an eye on what questions were coming in. So there are two things. One is, do you allow people to ask absolutely anything uh, you know, anonymously or put their name to it. I mean, I think if you ask people to put their names to questions, they tend to be slightly more respectful, you know, in, in what they ask. But but we did, uh, you know, want people to ask absolutely anything and feel free to do that. Um, if you want to organise something like that and you are a bit nervous, perhaps first time, about what, what, you know, how far people are going to go with their questions, you can always get people to submit questions in advance and then you can pick areas and say right we're going to answer the following sort of topics address the following topics or something so I think you can modify it and you get braver as you go along so I remember very well the very first ones we did and it was quite nerve-wracking and then I think the executives really enjoyed it actually and felt very happy that they were able to be so open with everybody and and it was very much appreciated so that that's the main answer but I'd love to if I can just say something also about this excellent question about um reconciling 
the, the sort of diversity with with a unifying culture. Yeah. Because interestingly, L'Oreal, of course, is, is not just one business. It's about 40 different businesses. So you've got Longcom, you've got Armani, you've got YSL, you've got Garnier, you've got, you know, uh, Redken. I mean, loads and loads of different businesses all of whom, all of which felt very different and unique and had their own culture and didn't particularly want to be seen as part of this, this big organisation all the time. Um, and I'd say the thing that L'Oreal grew very good at the time I was there was sort of, you know, it had these incredibly high standards of, of expectation of excellence in, you know, the commercial enterprise and in the marketing, was shifting that expectation to actually, we really expect you to embody this excellence in your behavior um, as well. And, and things like this ethics day I mentioned, but also enshrining other things like Citizens Day, creating an expectation of as an, as an organization, we share certain values and what are they? Um, and there was a sort of shift, I think, over the time that I was there in, in realizing we could apply that sort of excellence to all of our internal, you know, to talk about all of our and celebrate all of our internal activities too. Yeah, yeah. We conscious of the time. I want to move on to organisational matters. We could perhaps come back to this time, time permitting. We've had a couple of questions about kind of organisation. So we have one in advance, actually from the CIPD. Um, who in an organization should be actioning sustainability compliance and initiatives? Again, interesting word. Is it compliance or is it you know, encouragement and aspiration? And does it fall on one department uh, in the compliance area and so forth? So we also had a question, I think, from Kira. Um, what steps can you organizations take to break down silos to become a more sustainable business. Lauren, why don't you kick off on this one because of these, these um, your your two roles, two short job titles that makes a long one. Uh, Maybe I'll take the, the, the first one. Um, so uh, I think any, any business that scale these days, uh, and I think where the world is going from a sustainability perspective, uh, whether it's the climate or, or social responsibility, uh, or or governance, um, I think th th there's no way that one part of the organization can have full accountability for driving the the agenda. And we have this debate uh, very transparently within the Lego Group, where the sustainability team maybe call it five years ago, uh, five eight years ago, uh, was uh, and and the legal compliance team they were really the ones governing it, and it was highly centralized. Uh, but uh, given where the world is today and the scale of the Lego group, uh, that accountability has to get diffused across the organization. Uh, part of that happens naturally as each of us, as just as citizens of the world, connected with what's going on around us in a conscious organization, uh, starts to want to play a, an active role. And that's where you hope your employees would be, uh, given that... Uh, you know, they're, they're, they're part of different communities and they're dealing with the various issues in their respective communities and, and in their respective countries. So we actually are getting a lot of pull from employees. They want to do more. They want to be active. They want to take accountability. Uh, but then you need, again, these, these so-called mechanisms, establishing targets, pushing the targets through the organization, moving people. This uh, We've seen this transition at the Lego Group, moving people from the central team into the operating team uh, as things uh, mature. Uh, so I think that's uh, you know, kind of the evolution that, 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 that would happen. Um, I have a little less direct insight on, on kind of the silos. At least the Lego group is kind of a single entity. It's, it's a functional organization, so we have less of that. Uh, but I can imagine that um, the important thing is to establish a common set of goals and ambitions across uh, at the highest level of the organization to ensure that those are developed in an aligned way with the different business unit heads. And then uh, given the accountability, give the accountability to the business unit heads, then to make it come alive within their respective businesses. Yeah, yeah. David, what does what does the handbook say about sort of organizational <laughs> aspects? So I, th I think first off, we're not talking principally about compliance. Of course, 
organizations need to to obey the laws and 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 follow regulatory requirements and so on and of course sometimes and we were having a fascinating debate um, without breaching any confidences on our IBE board just a few weeks ago around some of what happens when sometimes different kind of sets of values clash with particular laws in one particular market, um, perhaps a marketplace which is not necessarily a democratic society and, and so on. So, of course, there is an important place for compliance and the Critical parts of being a responsible business is following the law and so on. But if you come with the mindset that this is about compliance, I think you're missing huge, huge potential. I am a great believer in what the late great Peter Drucker said shortly before he died to an American uh, academic, David Cooper Ryder. And Kira will will smile at this because she's one of my former students at, at, at Granfield, so delighted that um, she's with us today. Uh, she will, I'm sure, remember me quoting frequently the Peter Drucker idea that every global problem and social issue is a business opportunity in disguise. So I do want to emphasize this idea that sustainable business is ultimately not just about minimizing your risks by reducing your negative impacts, it's far more about maximizing your, your your positive impacts and finding business opportunities, creating new markets, new goods and services, and so on. So that's that, that's the first thing. I think um, we have other chapters in in the the handbook which also speak to this because if you're going to break down the silos and make sure this is part of everybody's business, yes, there are some clever things you can do as as Lauren was talking about in terms of the kind of uh, appraisal systems and the ways in which you can reward people at, at, at different levels. And one of the things that I'm increasingly fascinated by are those businesses who, as part of their overall commitments to being responsible and sustainable, are also now thinking really creatively about how we give all of our employees a stake in the system, whether that's through profit sharing or through employee share ownership programs, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but short of that, there's a critical role in terms of training leaders at all levels. And I think one of the things in the IBE that we've learned over the last few years is the importance of um, not just tone from the top, but also tone from above. In other words, your first line managers and investing, whether it's in the, the leadership training of first line managers around particular aspects of what we can do on climate emergency or what we're doing to improve our performance on employing disabled people or employing um, people of, 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 of different ethnicities, et cetera, et cetera that investment in, in leadership training and making this absolutely an integral part of what you need in your leadership toolkit to get to the top, that's a fundamental part too. And another and final way I'll just comment, we have another chapter in our handbook, which talks about the critical role of the board. And the board um, is so important in terms obviously of signing off on a, a wider societal purpose of ultimately approving the sustainability strategy and how it interrelates and increasingly is the same as the overall organizational strategy. But crucially, the board is also ultimately accountable for the, the culture of the organization. And is this a strong, positive, ethical, responsible, sustainable culture, or is it really rather a toxic culture? Mm. And the board has the accountability um, literally in my book, um, for the fact that um, it should be defining the desired culture of the organization, which it leads, and then periodically checking in to see is the actual culture and the desired culture aligned or are they way apart and what we're going to do to bring them together if they are way apart. So those are some of the practical things I think you can do to try and bring the organization together around sustainability.
Yeah. Maybe, uh, maybe Mike, if I could build yeah. on that and, and expand um, uh, the, the perspective, uh, because we've been talking uh, very much about uh, a sustainable culture or creating an ethical culture for a sustainable business moving forward in the context of the business. But of course, businesses have uh, uh, supply chains. And influence a lot of different businesses in the so-called ecosystem, and I think that is really a critical factor when it comes to uh, the environmental agendas. Uh, for example, many companies, their carbon footprint would be predominantly outside of their core business, and it would rather be in the upstream supply chain in the raw materials. Uh, you know, many organizations, of course, have, have factories or production uh, or vendors uh, working in in countries where uh, they may not be as sophisticated or as advanced in their thinking around some of the, the ethical or sustainability topics. And I think that's where it becomes important that the uh, the company's standards and aspirations are then radiated through all the, the interactions and at least the way in which the Lego group uh, approaches this as other organizations would, but, but we have, and we've signed up to this so-called responsible business principles and there's 12 principles, I'm not gonna list them out, uh, but they include you know, the ethical standards in terms of transparency, of our business partners in terms of the people, the workers' rights and their well-being. Uh, for us, we have a particular focus on children, uh, the impact of the lives of children uh, and families of workers in our supply chain. And then last, uh, uh, you know, is, is it really the environmental piece. And I think that's something that more and more businesses need to take uh, greater accountability for. So, Louise, if you can take add anything, and also take us on to to another area I'd like to cover, uh, which Claire has a question on about. Well, paraphrasing, you know, do you have to have a code of conduct? Um, does this stuff need to be written down, and if so, in what format? Um, and uh, so, let's let's open that up. But if you can take okay. us into that space. Okay, so so um, I love this idea of of um, this is you know everybody's business that that uh, David said. I think that's so important, and I think the great challenge, I suppose, is that everybody thinks this is somebody else's business. That sustainability is something that's sort of some somebody somewhere. There's an office that's got a sort of thing on the door saying sustainability, and and it doesn't really concern me. I just get on with you know doing what I do. Um, and, and I think the challenge is, as a leader in a business, how do you make it everybody's business? And, and it's a fantastic opportunity, actually, to motivate and inspire employees across the board because they want to, they want to do, you know, do good in their, in their lives. So um, I think that um, collaboration is, is super important for this um, because everybody is doing something and, and you know, whether it's, you know, um, auditing supply chains properly right the way down the down, downstream, whether it's, you know, making factories more environmentally friendly, whether it's being more responsible in your advertising or some of the things I touched on. And to me, the key for that is sharing. So I'm obsessed by communications. I think communications is the is the sort of fuel that, that you know, the rocket fuel in these organizations. And what we did at L'Oreal, I think, successfully, is to share examples. So we would celebrate um, everything we could hear about in the business. It was a good example. Every management meeting, videos, you name it, we would share these things to inspire people. But importantly, to introduce an element of competition because these young thrusting teams, when they see, oh gosh, you know, so-and-so has got the credit for doing something really clever and quirky and innovative over there in that factory in, in uh, Lyon, we'd better get, you know, our act together and do something even better so that the next time the management team highlight a good example, it's us. Yeah, well, and that yeah. was really effective yeah. actually in, in just, put, you know, introducing momentum into the whole thing and making it absolutely clear that it is everybody's business. It's not a dusty old team sitting in head office that, you know, nobody ever understands what they do. So that's that's one thing. And that's then a good of example of leadership, but yeah, that's a good example of leadership behavior. But don't yes. you have to write this stuff down? Yes. So then, yes, you do have to bring it alive and make it, dare I say, it, a little bit sexy and fun because some of this stuff can be very tedious and boring. So codes of conduct, people are immediately snoring um, in their seat. <laughs> and you know, I'll read that later and never get around to it. So I think you do have to have these things written down and sort of enshrined, as it were. 
Interestingly, I worked recently with Unilever on a, a new code of marketing for, um, dare I mention, skin lightening products in Asia. A uh, very, very interesting topic, which I could talk at length about. Um, and it was how to bring that alive. So yes, there was a very important code of conduct that if you've just been marketing, you know, Hellman's mayonnaise and you come on to skin lightening products, you better understand what the parameters are, what you can and can't say. Yeah. Um, but but how to bring that alive, that's always, so I think, yes, you need the, the thing written down and agreed properly sure. what we mean by it. But the challenge is don't just write it down and then put it in a drawer. You've got to bring it alive. You've got to train people in an engaging way. You've got to make little videos. You've got to make it part of their annual thing that they do. We used to have quizzes, for example. You know, you have to do a little quiz and it's part of your, has your team done it yet? And guess what? If you compete... Um, God, the legal team got 10 out of 10 for this, you know, thing or that sort of thing, you okay. know. Yeah, um, yeah. I'm just helps. keeping my eye on the time here. So I'm going to hand it over to, no, it's fine. It's all great stuff. I just want to get through all the topics before the, the bell strikes. Over to David. And I just wanted to throw the Johnson Johnson credo into the discussion, which I really love, um, but isn't the kind of conventional code of code of business principles or code of ethics. So what? how would you approach this? So as Louise was speaking, I was reminded, first of all, that uh, uh, at Cranfield, we have uh, worked with L'Oreal for many years on training of, 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 um, of, of managers, particularly when people become the country managers, because that's a very, very significant promotion. And I remember some years ago now, on one of the periodic refreshers of the L'Oreal Code of Ethics, which really is one of the, 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 the gold star um, codes of, of, of ethics and the way it's been embedded in an organisation over the years really is that there's a lot to learn from. And indeed, we had a UK memorial lecture um, in the Institute just a few years ago from um, uh, Emmanuel Lula, who for many years was the chief ethics officer of, of L'Oreal, talking about the way in which they pulled it all together. But I remember this particular um, nugget, which I have always taken with me and thought was brilliant, because what L'Oreal did um, on this particular refresh of their code of ethics was they didn't just produce it en français, or maybe en français and en, 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 en anglais, but actually they, they translated it into, I think from memory, about 35 different languages. And very, very cleverly, they got the country manager in each case to do the launch event and to explain the updated code of ethics and what were some of the new elements that were now being covered, et cetera, and why it was important. And of course, we all know that if you really want to learn something, the best way of learning something is knowing you've got to teach it. And I thought, gosh, if you really want a great practical tip for how to get something which is really fundamental, and yet might in the case of L'Oreal feel, gosh, that's Paris, long, long away from Shanghai or a long way uh, from New York. Um, but if you've got the country manager standing there in front of the meeting or in front of the, of, of, of the camera, explaining why this new code of ethics is important and how it's developed and so on, that's one very clever way of bringing it to life and getting um, buy-in from a critical part of, of the organization. I did just want to pick up, we do, by the way, Louise, have a whole chapter, but it's later in the handbook on communication. So we'd love separately offline to have a chat later on about um, whether you think we, 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 we've got the right emphasis uh, there. And we're already thinking about a second edition. So if you can see some better examples for that, it would be wonderful to, to put into the mix. But I wanted to pick up because what Lauren was saying about the importance now of particularly the global businesses like a L'Oreal or like a Lego, thinking about the, the ripple effects that they have through their global supply chains. And we put quite a lot of emphasis in the handbook um, on um, looking at collaboration, but we presented the collaboration in retrospect principally in the context of collaboration with other businesses through things like say the Consumer Goods Forum um, or through the World Business Council on Sustainable Development or whatever it may be, or dare I say it, collaboration through the Institute of Business Ethics or with um, NGOs, civil society, universities and, and so on. But I think actually we, we treated it rather as 
axiomatic, and maybe we should have made it much more explicit, but there's a crucial part of building partnerships and maintaining partnerships inside organizations, particularly when they're multinational and, 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 and they get much, much larger. I was listening to Sir Roger Carr this morning, the, uh, the chair of um, BAE Systems, another of our long serving and long standing supporters of the, the Institute of Business Ethics. And, uh, and uh, he was talking about um, BAE Systems employing 143,000 people across the, or, or providing supporting 143,000 jobs across the UK and so on. Uh, it, it, it emphasized for me again this importance of internal partnerships across a business as well as the external partnerships. Okay. Didn't want to lose that thought. Yep, thank you. I'm just conscious time is quick. I wanted to get one whole new topic in. Um, and then just to give you forewarning, David, we hadn't planned this, but I think we should give you the last word. So have a think about what your what your takeaway uh, for all our participants today is the, the, the final the final message. The whole new topic is kind of where is this stuff going, uh, given that we live in this wacky, wacky vodka world? Um, um, either short, I'm going to throw this one at Lauren. So either short term, the pandemic. So we've seen some behavioral changes, um, uh, you know, in, th through pandemic. A lot of this stuff being quite harder to learn, by example, if all you're doing is looking at a screen all day long. So any, any thoughts about where this is going short term? And then perhaps more medium term, kind of the digital revolution, which is, you know, has a long way to go yet, whether this is webcams in factories or whatever. Um, this idea that culture is how you behave when no one's looking, but, you know, there's a camera looking at any moment. So, Lauren, over to you and then colleagues. Where is this going long term, short term? Right. That's a big question to answer yeah. <laughs> in a short period of time. But I, I would say, I mean, I mean, the, it, it, there's like opposing forces and, and it's it's really been interesting. So the topic has never become more critical, uh, but some of the things happening in the world today are making it uh, more difficult. If you take the environmental uh, dimension, uh, obviously the, the climate is, is getting worse. There was a lot of progress and a lot of momentum. And then you have a war in Ukraine and that's driving up fuel costs and that creates significant and very real trade-offs because it's easy from an environmental perspective to say ethically, uh, we, well, we shouldn't be using coal anymore. But uh, you know, if you drive the cost of your business up, reduce your profitability, can you continue to employ everyone? So I think that's a really interesting short-term dilemma that I think all companies and uh, and NGOs and organizations have to deal with uh, in the world. But moving forward, uh, I think we're well beyond the point of, of no return. And that's mainly because consumers in the end are going to demand much more of organizations. And they're looking for companies that are purpose-driven, that are values-driven, where the, whose values are congruent with the individual's values, not so many of them today are willing to pay a premium for that because there is a cost. Uh, they tell, you know, in a lot of surveys that we do, and I'm sure other companies, yeah, they want the products to be environmental, but they, they're not willing to, uh, they say they're willing to pay more, but in practice, they're not. But I think in the long term, you're going to see that shift uh, and that will create opportunities within organizations for uh, sustainable cultures to, to thrive and to win. Okay, no. Yeah, Great. I would add to that, Mike, if I may. Yeah, yeah, no, um, I was coming to you next. Yeah, I, okay. I think I think people, and it's and it's a good thing, are becoming much more aware of you know what goes into making their products. And so, I mean, I don't know who who watched the program the other night on um, cocoa farmers in Ghana, and you know I've seen that, funny enough, from the other side because I worked also with Save the Children for many years. So I've been to some of these places like Bangladesh and seen you know, workers in garment factories. And, but I equally love going to Zara and buying lots of, you know, um, fast fashion. So I think people are asking those questions actually about what goes into the product that they buy. And I think companies have to more and more have their values absolutely front and central because 
you know, you have to make very quick decisions about things and you can't, um, you can't get it wrong. I mean, it's, it's catastrophic for your business and brand if you get it wrong. And it was fascinating for me watching the deliberations of companies very quickly about Russia. Do we, do we come out? Do we stay in? What do, you know, what's the right thing to do? Because actually you can make a very quick, oh, we're leaving as a sort of protest, but actually what about all the employees? If you've got thousands of employees in Russia, do they lose their jobs overnight? Is that, you know, to, to whom are you accountable? Um, and the, I think the pressure to do the right thing on businesses is going to become greater and greater and, and what you do will be more scrutinized and more transparent. Um, and I think, I think that's all very good, but companies really need to be thoughtful and nimble and agile in how they do business um, yeah. in the future. Yeah, so a lot of acceleration there. David, over, over to you for um, where this is going. What's in what's in addition to the book um, on culture, whether it's pandemic or digital or anything else of these mega trends? So actually, we are already being asked seriously about um, what are the gaps that that should go into uh, a, a second a second edition. It feels like we've only just delivered the manuscript on, on 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 the last one. I have to say, I agree very much with what both Louise and Lauren have just been saying. I would build on that to say I think the biggest set of pressures are coming first from employees and would be employees, and I think consumers are coming in behind. But I I think for practical purposes for the next few years, it's employees and would be employees really asking more and more searching questions, and especially younger people, the Greta generation, mm -hmm. being prepared to really push. And we're seeing it in a number of the big tech companies right now on the kind of business that some of these companies like, like Google or, or Facebook are, are doing or um, the employees challenging about doing or are they doing enough in the case of Apple on climate emergency, et cetera, et cetera. So for me, I think really big pressures from, from uh, em employees as, uh, as the immediate. I think if we look a little bit ahead, the interrelationships between the responsibilities that a good business takes for the health and well-being in the round of employees and how that fits in with the climate emergency and the impacts of climate on health and also associated other environmental issues like air quality and so on. I think that coming together of the agenda and people seeing much more clearly how they interrelate and how they reinforce each other either positively or negatively that for me is, 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 is what's coming down the track very, very fast. And I do think back to Louisa's point about heightened expectations of, on, on business. I think you know, there's going to be a sense that you can't just say, well, we're really good on the environment. So give us a free pass on our corporate tax strategy yes. or on our executive compensation and the fact that we're still not doing um, equal pay for equal work and so on. So we've still got massive gender disparities on pay or we've got race disparities on pay or disability pay gap, et cetera, et cetera. So I think there is going to be, as part of what Louise rightly says, is heightened expectations. It is going to be heightened expectations of you looking at this in the round. So I've been saying for some time now, what's your corporate tax strategy? What's your strategy in terms of lobbying responsibly and so on? Um, if, if, if you're giving me the last word, Mike. I am, because we're in the last closing minutes. So let's- I, 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 I was watching the, watching the clock as well. So I, 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 I had to get up about three o'clock the other morning um, to do a live uh, webinar with Asia. And the webinar was uh, called Three Things You Need to Know About Sustainability. And just to maybe in that same spirit, wrapping up, that's a much more civilized hour of the day. Um, I think the first thing you need to know, as both Lauren and Louise have just been saying, in the VUCA world, taking responsibility for your impacts and treating this as an integral part of how you run successful business, this is now the new business normal. This is not a management fad. This is not just a passing phase. This is, is the, new, the new normal. That requires, secondly, that you really do some serious hard work 
to understand what are your most material impacts, both in your core business. And as Lauren was, was emphasizing and Louise was just picking up with the example of cocoa in Ghana, also in your supply chain and having better understanding of what's happening in our su supply chains. And thirdly, in terms of what you really need to know about, about these questions, I think is you need to totally engage the board and the senior leadership. And if you haven't yet done so, to really have a serious debate, you know, an offsite for a day or two days. Yes, you did hear me say that, you know, a day or two days, getting the board to explore what they understand by these issues and what they mean for the particular business which they are leading. And what's the scale of their ambition? And what do they need to do in order to achieve the scale of ambition? And I love the point that Louise has kept making about the value of encouraging the competitive spirit, both within an organization and between businesses. Because I'm a great believer in the potential of business done well, the entrepreneurial force, the push, the drive to find innovative solutions to the global problems and the, and the business opportunities in disguise. Excellent. Thank you, David. That's a, a great end to what's been a really great discussion. Um, so thank you very much to our three panelists. We're already getting uh, comments in the chat for people who've had to leave to say how, how good it's been. And don't forget, we are recording it so you can come back and, and watch it again. So thank, thank you all. Thank you for participating. A few sort of housekeeping things. Firstly, in relation to the Institute, if you're not already on board as a, as a supporter, please join. We have a lot of great supporters, but we're not full up by any means. So please, if you're not uh, already uh, online uh, or on our books as a supporter, please visit the website and join. Um, please do look out David's book. You can purchase it uh, from Kogan Page from all good bookshops online or offline. Um, so please, I can recommend it. I got to see an early draft and I can really recommend it. And we've only really touched a, a fragment of it today. So please do follow up with David's book. In terms of uh, IBE events that we've got coming up, let me just tip, tip you off about those. Uh, we've got a training session, Understanding Business Ethics, so all the details are on our website to sign up to the training course, and we've talked a lot about uh, upskilling and, and doing things better today. We've got another event coming up uh, later, well, in, in May, 17th of May, Measuring Ethical Conduct. Lauren was talking about putting KBIs, KPIs behind the promises, so it's not all just words. Um, so come and join us for that. Um, and uh, when the screen goes blank up, we'll pop a feedback survey. So please do fill that in because it's really helpful for us to know how you found today. So stick with us, follow us um, on Twitter and elsewhere, join the Institute, uh, and thank you for coming along and joining us today. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you, Mike.